In this video, I'm doing a little bit of a study because we were reading Isaiah 22 last Tuesday, and there's this mention in Isaiah 22, verse 20, that in that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. So we know that he that God is using Eliakim in order to represent Jesus. And we all kind of stopped and we're like, who's Eliakim? <laughs> what did Eliakim do? And there are, are, are a few different Eliakims in the word, but this is specifically talking about Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and Hilkiah was the priest. And Eliakim is defi- described as the administrator, and he's always seen with Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. But Eliakim's always mentioned first, of course, that makes sense, because he's the administrator, and an administrator is the one who's responsible for running a business or an organization. So that's the first thing, is Hilkiah, excuse me, Eliakim has been placed in a position of authority to run an organization. So, but that may not give us all of the information that we need. It might be just enough information, but I have a feeling usually there's a little bit more to it when God has chosen someone in the word to represent his son. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now, uh, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, this particular Eliakim is mentioned in second Kings ver- uh, chapter 18, also in chapter 19 and the same story. And then there's another, uh, a different Eliakim mentioned in chapter 23 and second Chronicles 36 and Nehemiah 12. Those are different Eliakims, but we go back to Eliakim, son of Hilkiah in Isaiah 22 and also in Isaiah 36. And that same story that's being told in second Kings is also being told in Isaiah 36. So we're just going to read it from there. And we're going to read it from the perspective of trying to understand what role did Eliakim, this palace administrator, what role did he have? Aside from being one who was running this organization, running the palace, what other what other uh, characteristics does he have that are going to help us to understand why does God choose to use Eliakim to represent Christ? Now, one other thing that occurs to me is that Eliakim, during that time, when Isaiah is prophesying this, Eliakim, during that time, was in this position of being the palace administrator. So it would kind of be like, this is a terrible example because, of course, our rulers are not righteous, but it would be like using President so-and-so of the current time, I shudder to even use his name, in order to represent the authority that God is giving to somebody else. So it may just be those two things. These are the things that I'm thinking right off the bat, but we're going to read the context of this story, and we're going to see if there's any other information that God gives us. So we're going to read parts of Isaiah, well, we're going to read the whole chapter of 36, and then he's also mentioned again in Isaiah 37. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lashish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to him. The field commander said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says, On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have counsel and might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. That's quite the insult there. (laughs) So he says, such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't the one whose high... Places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Okay, so he's made a bold statement. He's saying, the Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. And destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the field commander, please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. So they're trying to have a private conversation. 
But the commander replied, was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the people sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Have the gods of any nation ever delivered their lands from the king of, uh, from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of uh, Sepharvaim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries have been able to save their lands from me? How then can the Lord de- deliver Jerusalem from my hand? He's being very blasphemous, right? So he has on the one hand said that the Lord has sent him. And now he's saying, don't listen to Hezekiah. And he's saying, no one's going to be able to deliver you from my hands. No one's going to be able to deliver you from the king of Assyria and what he has set out to do. Does that sound kind of like Satan? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Okay, King Hezekiah commanded, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator Shebna, the secretary and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the moment of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, tell your master this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you've heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. When the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lashish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. Now Sennacherib received a report that Terhaka, the king of Cush, was marching out to fight against him. When he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with with this word. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you. When he says Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria, surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Resef, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Arpad? Where are the kings of Lear, Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wooden stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word the Lord has spoken against him. Virgin daughter Zion despises and mocks you. Daughter Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it you've ridiculed and blasphemed? Against who have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers, you have ridiculed the Lord, and you have said with many chariots, I have ascended to the heights of the mountains, the utmost heights of Lebanon. Okay, Satan. I have cut down its tallest cedars, the choicest of its junipers. I have reached its remotest heights, the finest of its forests. I have dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. 
With the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard? Long ago, I ordained it. In days of old, I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you have turned fortified cities into piles of stones. Their people drained of power are dismayed and put to shame. They are like plants in the field, like tender green shoots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it even grows, before it grows up. But I know where you are and where you come and go and how you rage against me. Because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put a hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. This will be the sign for you, Hezekiah. This year, you will eat what grows by itself, and the second year, what springs from that, but in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more, a remnant of the kingdom of Judah will take root before, below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build siege ramps against it. By the way he came, he will return. He will not enter the city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of, my, of David, my servant. Do you guys see the symbolism here for end times? Like, do you see what God is promising us here? You know, Hezekiah is worried. Everybody's worried that what the king of Assyria is saying in all his pomp and arrogance and thinking that he can overcome God and that he can, you know, claim to be serving God when he, everybody knows darn well that he doesn't. It's all bark, but listen to what God's saying. By the way he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, the city of Jerusalem, that's us, declares the Lord. I will descend, defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and he withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Who's big talking now? One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisruk, his sons and Dramalak and Sherezer killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Ezerhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Well, there's his end. Okay, so uh, one of the questions that comes up for me is, well, why didn't God use King Hezekiah as a symbol for Christ? But it seems to me that this position that he has placed Christ in as sort of the administrator over what the Father has planned because that's essentially Christ, that's what Christ has done, right? He is the administrator over the Father's plans. So that's how I'm understanding this function, this role, uh, that he's the one out there going and doing all of this hard work and going back to the Father and consulting with him. Not that the Father doesn't see what's going on, but don't you think that that's what Christ was doing? I mean, don't you see that story don't you see that in your own personal experience? If in anything that you're doing, whatever authority you've been given here, you're going back and you're saying, Lord, this is the position that we're in. What would you have me do? Lord, this is the position of the body right now. This is the position of my children, of my husband, of my wife. What would you have me do? What is your plan? This is the way that we need to serve God. We don't serve God by our own ideas. We don't serve God by our own uh, self-contrived ministries and, and this sort of thing. We need to take a lesson from the example of Christ. Christ said repeatedly, I don't speak on my own authority. I say only what I've heard from the Father. How many people are actually doing that? Because I don't hear anyone speaking truth. I know that I sit in the council of God. I know that what I tell you is what I've heard from him, but I don't hear other people doing that. I hear people talking about ministries that are like a music ministry. Okay. I mean, have fun with that, but I don't say, how are you suffering in your music ministry for God? A prayer ministry? Guys, all of us are supposed to be praying. What is a prayer ministry? A deliverance ministry in which people don't teach anyone about repentance. They just tell them, here's a memorized prayer. Here's some things to say. Then muster up your authority in your flesh to drive it out. I mean, these things are just ridiculous. The things that are going on in counterfeit Christianity. What happened to serving God, to actually serving him. How in the world are you going to say that you're serving someone when you don't have any relationship with them and you don't go back and sit in their council and ask them, what would you have me do today? What's 
please give me my daily bread. My, Lord, my heart is laid bare before you. Clean me up so that I can be of benefit to you, so that I can be used by you today. Father, this is what's going on right now in the body, in my house. How would you like to use me? How can I serve you? That's the position that we need to take with God. That's the position of Eliakim. That is the position that Jesus takes with the Father. Please discern this message with God.